I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that um, we have finally had this opportunity after it seems like a couple months where it's slow at point, at point, and then kind of picks up, and then all of a sudden we are here and we're, we are very excited. I was telling somebody else, I feel like a bottle of pop that's been shook up and just ready to go. There's someone got to open the cap. Uh, first off, I do want to pass along my thanks to Daryl. Um, you have been a blessing throughout this whole process. You were a blessing as a cluster leader, but even more so in this transitional period. We, we have met and had conversations and have enjoyed those conversations. And I, I was thinking about how I could properly honor you for that. And part, part of my mind went to, I could give him a box of golf balls. I know he likes the golf balls. I, I just lose those, so yeah, that wouldn't work out very well. Um, but I guess the, the best way that I can honor him is by asking you guys um, to honor him well. As you already have been, the cards will continue to do, um, whether it's through the luncheon or going up to him, just saying, Daryl, thank you so much uh, for the ministry that you have uh, given to this church, Barbara as well. Um, and I, I'm excited because we're doubly blessed because he's still here, right? We still get to have, have the blessing of, being, of, of them being a part of our community. And so um, I'm thankful for everything in between. And the stuff there, I keep giving feedback, so I'm going to stay right here for a minute. Um, that being said, um, again, we're excited. We're on Facebook. If you um, uh, are on Facebook, you can uh, send out a friend invitation to, to Jamie and myself. That would help us to get to know you if that's one of those mediums that you use. Um, also, on the, just the one quick thing before I actually get into the sermon, um, on your bullet all those, your program sheets, or whatever you want to call them. Um, there's an email for me. If you send me an email at that address currently, um, it will not get to you. So it's currently being set up. I'm hoping that it will be this week. You probably can't you hear can contact that me through email, or what I'm sure sending one to Elizabeth will be, will be fine. She'll figure out a way to get that information. But I think we'll be good to take that email taken care of this week, and so we'll look forward to being able to engage with you in that way. Well, all of that being said, let's get to the Word of God. I'm so excited. I was uh, so grateful for to be able to, to worship God together with you. Um, and I'm looking forward to more and more of those moments where we get to, whether it's singing His praises or diving into His Word, I, I, I am so grateful. And, once again, probably the last time I'm going to try to use that word, excited uh, to be able to, to, to share those experiences with you. We serve a great Savior. And he loves us. And, and the, the more we get to draw near to him and experience that love, the more our lives will change. I'm just looking forward to being a part of that journey with you. So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to be there in just a minute. The passages are going to be up on the screen as they are normally here. Um, but you may find it useful to have them in front of you as we move along. With this being my first sermon, I, I wanted to give you a Cliff Notes version of kind of my process that I, I do in, in forming a sermon each week. It's, this sermon in particular is going to be a little bit different because most often I, I like to just settle on one passage of scripture as our main passage and go from there. This morning is, is, is kind of different, we'll have three. Um, but each week you can expect to, on the back of those programs, or bulletins, um, those sheets, we'll just call them sheets. <laughs> there you go. On the back of those sheets, you can expect to see um, fill in the blank points um, each week when I teach. Um, and, and typically there are seven. Uh, and, and each of those seven points are broken down to three categories. And I want to tell you why. At one point in my ministry, I was reading in my devotions and I came across um, the parable of the sower, right? It's probably one of my favorite parables, um, now definitely, but even from Early on, I love that parable, especially the Mark 4 passage in this particular moment, uh, when I, uh, a couple years ago, it seemed like. Uh, and in verse 13 of that passage, Jesus has the disciples coming to him, asking him a question about, what, what, what does this parable mean? And he says this to him, it's right on the screen, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And when I came across that passage, there was something in me that thought, huh, there must be something about what's said within this parable that's really important for us to grasp. There's something here that impacts our ability to understand God's truth, apply God's truth, and see God's truth produced in our lives from this truth. 
And so from that passage, and from that parable, I began to shape the, my, my sermons around uh, the structure of that parable. So usually the first three points are what I, and like I said, usually most often the first three points are what I like to call seeds of truth. They're truths that have been taken directly from the passages that we look at. Next, there is two, usually two points that, are, that I call address the soil. And in those points, we talk about the things that are going on in our heart and the obstacles that are going to keep God's word, his truth, from being produced in our lives. And then finally, there are the biblical fruit points where I talk about the and, and identify the impacts that those truths, those seeds, are meant to have when they grow, and as the Spirit um, causes them to grow in us, the, the kind of things that are produced in and through us as a result. Now, again, that's the Cliff Notes version of my process. I can tell you more, but I'd rather just give it to God's Word. So, that being said, today is a standalone message. Standalone message that I've entitled Because of Jesus. In the future, when you receive an email or a letter, any type of communication from me, except maybe text, um, you'll see those three words at the bottom of the page. It's a statement that has become very dear to me. Um, that, that's come to mean quite a lot. And so as we consider what that statement means, we're going to look at how our lives are, are, have been, are being, and will be impacted because of Jesus. Because of what he has done, because of who he is, and what he's offering to us. In his classic work, uh, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer wants to quote this. I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate. You see, things can change because of Jesus. But on the flip side, like to Tozer points out, the more we find ourselves away from Jesus, um, the more precarious positions we put ourselves in, right? The, the, the greater danger we, we, we find ourselves in, and the further we end up drifting away from God. And, and, and so, in my uh, sermons to you each week, one of my desires is to accomplish that first goal that, that told your study. I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. I hope each week when you come, that is a truth that you can say, I long for God a little bit more today in some way than I did before I came. I want to point you to Jesus. I want to stir your affections for Jesus. And I want to spur you on in the pursuit of Jesus. Since life is different because of Jesus. That being said, let's get to stirring and spurring. As we begin reading in verse 17. And we'll get to 2 Corinthians instead of 1 Corinthians in my Bible. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Stop right there for a moment. So the first thing I want us to, to recognize, the truth that we're reminded of in this passage, is because of Jesus, we have peace with our past. And that point's going to pop up right about now. There you are. Because of Jesus, we have peace with our past. See, in Christ we're made new. That's what that passage, what Paul is saying in that. If anyone is in Christ, he's become a new creation. He's been reconciled back to God by the grace of God. And then Paul says something pretty amazing. He says, and through that process of reconciliation, God no longer counts our sins against us. 
Peace can exist. This is an amazing truth. We can just close it up and say, Amen, that's awesome. If if that's all we are reminded of today, this is a powerful truth we need to hold on to. The past doesn't have to define us any longer. What Paul says is all of this is from God. The ability for you to have peace with your past doesn't come from anything else but from God and what He has done for you. Because He made the decision to send His Son, who knew no sin, who had never sinned, and to place our sins upon Him. Right? And He did it purposefully, so that we might become the righteousness of God. So that there could be peace between us and Him. And because there is peace between us and Him, again, those sins of the past, those things that you think define who you are, that the enemy wants to get you to believe defines who you are, they can stay back there. Amen. And you can move forward. And they don't have to keep chasing you. That's an amazing truth. Because of Jesus, you can have peace with your past. And because you've experienced that on some level at some point, when you sometimes lose track, when you make a decision you know you shouldn't make and do something you know you shouldn't do, because you know how Jesus can make peace with the past and draw you closer to God, you know the path to get back on track. There's this passage in Scripture, throw it out there in this second, 1 John 1 9, that says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, or, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, so peace has been made, absolutely. And, and sometimes when we wander off, there's a little bit of a lack of peace. 1 John 1 9 just says, Hey, listen, just get back on track. Confess those sins. God will purify you because God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you that you can become God's righteousness. What an amazing truth that is. And one of the neat things that Paul says is, is as we get to experience this peace that no longer defines us by our past, it doesn't just stop with us. We get to become ambassadors or representatives telling other people that their past doesn't have to define them either. That there can be forgiveness. Things change because of Jesus. There's more. There's so much more. Let's look at one of them in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 19 it says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way of open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled and cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Second truth I want to remind you of from God's word. Because of Jesus, we can have confidence in the present. We can have confidence because we have been given access to the Father. We can draw close to Him because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, this is something that is sometimes taken for granted in our culture. This opportunity that is before us. You see, because the people that the author of Hebrews was writing to in that moment, they understood what the Jewish sacrificial, sacrificial system was all about. They understood how there was limited access in the temple. Certain people could only go to certain places, right? And, and when you talk about the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, only one person could go there once a year on behalf of the people, right? And what, what the author is saying in this moment is because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us, he opened up the way for any of us to come before God and find help, right? We didn't need a, a priest. To, to, to go before us and represent us before God. We were given the opportunity to draw near every single day. 
And because we can draw near to God's presence, we can have confidence in the presence. And when we access this presence continually, we find the help that we need in the situations that we face. Amen. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive and find grace to help us in the time of need. That happens because of Jesus. You're going through struggles, you can approach the throne of grace and say, Lord, I need your help right now. I need peace. I need strength. I need hope. And what that promises us is you have the access to go there and find it. You have the access to go in there and find the hope that you need. So we draw near. But one of the things that we need to realize figure out where that was. If I did, oops. If I messed something up, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's my first Sunday, so I get a free pass on a lot of things, right? <laughs> Sounds like this works. We're going to stay here. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you hear that buzz, but... Ooh. <laughs> Anyways, we've been given access to approach the throne of grace to find mercy and power for our time of need. But here's the thing. The confidence that we can live with in the present is not a foregone conclusion. Right? If you were to, to look at this passage um, and, and kind of just meditate on it for a while, you would notice that this says two words a, a number of times. Um, let us. Right? And I'm not going to bore you about the Greek and, 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 and what type of um, word that is, but when those words are used in front of the verb that they, they come before, it's talking about something that's a possibility, right? It's, talk, it's talking about something that could happen, that, that even should happen, but it doesn't automatically happen, right? And so we have to understand that, yes, we can have confidence in the present, but that confidence comes from us making the choice to do the thing that that passage talks about. Because of Jesus, let us draw near with confidence, right? Because of Jesus, let us find a renewal through the grace that comes that is able to, to cleanse us, right? That is able to transform us. Because of Jesus, let us continue to find strength from remembering the fact that God has given us his promises. And if God has given us his promises, he is able to keep those promises. Let us draw near and find strength from one another. It's important to do that. And that's not just talking about church, right? Some people look at that and think, I told them talking about church. It's talking about get together and find encouragement in your faith for one another. Because as you do that, as you do all the things, as you follow all of those let us exhortations, you find the confidence that you need in the moment. Because you remember who your confidence is in. And when you know who your confidence is in, and when you know that he is faithful, there's something powerful that takes place in our lives. And again, all of these things, all of these opportunities that Hebrews 10 talks about become possibilities for us because of Jesus. Let's, let's go to our last passage in Romans 8. <coughs> Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then if you were to skip down to verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know. Say we know. We know. One more time. We know. We know. That in 
all things. God works for the good of those who love him, for those who have been called according to his purpose. So the third thing I want to remind you of because of Jesus is this. Because of Jesus, we have hope for the future. If we have any hope, it's only because of him. You see, what Paul is making an observation there, and we don't necessarily appreciate his observation, but when we stop to think about it at the beginning, it it allows us to, to receive God's truth, and that is any present difficulty that you face, any past difficulty you've had to endure, any future difficulty that's coming your way, none of those things compare to the greatness of what's in store for you because of Jesus. That there's this hope that we get to cling to, that we get to hold on to. That because of Jesus, there is something worth living for. Because of Jesus, there's something worth suffering for. Because of Jesus, there is something worth dying for. There's something to look forward to. Something that we long with eager expectation to see God's plan fully completed. Complete restoration of creation and the way that we were designed to live. Now, in saying this, I don't want to I don't want to gloss over your pain. Right? When, 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 when Paul says, hey, I, I don't consider the present circumstances to compare to the glory that's going to be revealed to you. He's not glossing over pain. Like Paul knew pain. Right? Shipwreck, beaten. He knew the suffering. He, he knew the brokenness. He knew the regrets, right? Because he didn't necessarily start off the way he needed to. He also knew what Jesus was offering. And in comparison to what is being offered, everything else pales in comparison. That's how good it is. And because if you know how good it is, it doesn't make necessarily the difficulties enjoyable. But when you have something to focus on in the moment, you can have something that will help you press forward through those challenges. Paul's saying, hey, listen, God's promise, it, it, it's going to be worth it. And so we wait patiently, because it hasn't been restored. We're still sin. We still experience brokenness and tragedy. We're still disappointed. We still struggle with various things at times. So we're waiting as God's people, longing for this hope that we have in heaven Jesus. And I love this. God is so good. Not only has he given us great and precious promises that the scripture talks about, he's given us a helper. Because there's moments where you don't even know how to pray for yourself. Like, you're so frustrated and so broken or so angry or so whatever, filled with fearful and anxious, whatever that could be. He's given us a spirit who prays for us, who leads us in the truth, who corrects us, gives us a kick in the backside when we need it. He breathes life into us, strengthens us, reminds us, so that we don't lose sight of the hope that we have, so that we can get to the place that God desires us to go. How awesome is God that not only has He given us a, 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 a place to go, but He's given us a way to get there. And he's given us a partner to help each and every one of us. <coughs> There's something powerful that. Because of that, our hope in Christ is relieved. And then we get to this other passage. That not only have we been given a helper, but we've been given this reminder. In all things, God works for good of those who are. And that doesn't mean, because sometimes we can get tripped up on this if we really think about it. Experience a, a tragedy in your family. How is God working for good right now in my life? Like, that doesn't make sense. If he wanted to, he could have stopped us, right? So how, how, what, what does this verse mean? I don't think this verse means that God works for the good as far as keeping us comfortable. Doing everything we want him to do when we want him to do it. I think this verse means God works for the good in all circumstances because in all circumstances he is 
helping us become more and more like the image of the Son. This is about Christ likeness, not comfort. When he works all things for the good, that's, that's him conforming us more and more into the image of his Son, where life and freedom and blessing flow. So yeah, my brokenness and my pain and my disappointments, he can work even that for good because he can use that to draw me closer to himself. And when I'm drawn closer to himself, things can change. And all of this becomes possible because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can have peace, we can have hope, we can have confidence. But what things are going to get in the way from us experiencing that? Right? Those are great truths. Amen? Three, three seeds of truth? All right, let's close it up and get to some eating. <laughs> no, there's some things that get in the way that can keep that from becoming real in our lives. First one is this. You gotta stop trying to earn what Jesus is really giving you. You see, for whatever reason, whether it's our own personal pride or whether it's um, ignorance of the truth, we can think that, that we need to earn peace from our past. We need to make up for our mistakes. Or somehow we need to do something in order to, to, to be able to have confidence in the present or hope for the future. Or somehow those things rely on our performance. Right? We can be deceived into thinking that's the case. We can try to earn the things that Jesus is freely trying to offer. That he desires for us to have. You see, the truth is, Jesus gives his love freely. We don't have to do anything to earn it. And there's something when we realize that, that that's powerful, that does something in us. That means I don't have to try to, to behave just the right way in order to deal with God or, or feel, um, make God feel obligated to work on my behalf. Right? I obey because I've been loved. And because I've been loved so well, I just respond simply, joyfully, because of Jesus and the love that He's given to me. You see, the enemy has plans to deceive you from the things that Jesus freely wants to give you. If He can get you to buy into a different program, to make you think you have to earn it, He can get you caught up in a performance trap. Or, or maybe he can get you to the point of, of trusting in other sources, right? If he can't get you to, to, um, to not trust in Jesus to provide those things, or I should say, if he can't get you to try to earn those things yourself, he'll get you to try to earn them through another source. All right, all right. So begin to trust in money as your God and as your hope for the future. Begin to trust in your job security for your peace, um, right now, or your confidence in the present. Try to do some other way. If he can't get you to, to, not, or to not earn it yourself, he'll get you to try to trust in another source. Because he'll do whatever he can to take it away from Jesus so that he can have a, a, an open door to do what he loves to do, John 10, 10. Kill, steal, and destroy. Whatever way possible. And he's okay with doing it by inches. The devil doesn't have to kill you all at once. He's okay with letting you take one step. And then slowly enough, you continue to fall further and further away from your trust in Jesus. He's patient like that. Sometimes a whole lot more patient than we are. Whatever can get you to turn away from Jesus, he'll do. So what do we have to do? Position yourself to freely receive what Jesus really desires to give. That means you're going to have to be humble. That means you're going to have to be dependent. But we don't like those two words. At least not for ourselves. Like, I'm okay with Daryl having to be humble. Right? I'm okay with Sean having to be dependent. But me? Okay, in some situations when I know it's way out of my control, but I like to have a sense of control that I can kind of handle on something. This passage reminds me, or because the scripture reminds me, and these truths remind me, you need to be humble and daily dependent 
You know, that's kind of the design. I don't know if you know that. God's not up in heaven looking for self-reliant people. He's not. Because he's seen what self-reliant people have done over the course of history. They get goofy. They get goofy real fast. He's looking for God in people. Because those who rely on God, who receive the things that he really wants to offer to them, are those who, who fall in line with his plans and purposes. So let's, let's not be self-reliant, let's be God-reliant on a daily basis. Second thing I want to point out that's going to keep the Jews from being able to produce their fruit is that distance from Jesus limits the power of these truths in our lives, those three seeds that we talked about at the beginning. The further the distance is between you and Jesus, the less power those truths will have. You might feel like you have no hope right now, I would say maybe it's because you drifted a little bit. You might feel like you don't have any confidence in the present. I would say, how far have you gotten away from your relationship to the Lord? You might feel like there's no hope in your future right now. I would say, where are you at? And what details are you looking at? Because I think of the, the, the Israelites in the Exodus. They had you know, they got caught up in it and they messed up a bunch of times and they teach us lessons. But all they needed to be reminded of was that there was a pillar of fire and cloud that went before them. They didn't have to look at the Red Sea, they didn't have to look at the army, they didn't have to look at whatever detail was in front of them. All they had to know was that God was with them. And the closer they remained to him, the more they were reminded of that truth. Like them, we can sometimes drift and forget that if God is by our side, who can stand against us? What situation can really overcome us? So the further the distance that you have, the less power these truths have in your life. And when you find yourself here and in places that you don't need to be, that aren't beneficial, what do you do at that moment? What do you, well, I gotta earn my way back to Jesus? I gotta do something to prove that I'm really, really sorry and that I deserve to be back with him? No. First John 1 9. We confess our sins. He's freely, he freely forgives us and cleanses us of, us of those things. Maybe this can be a hook that, that, that can, can help you. If you. Either you find yourself in that position this morning or um, you inevitably find that at some point down the road. When you mess up, oh no. And then offer up that sin to God. Because then you're going to find a grace that's going to pick you up so that you can get back on track and continue to lift him up. If you mess up, own up, offer up, pick up the grace so that you can continue to lift up the name of Jesus. Maybe that'll help. Because, again, in that group, I'm going to make choices. Daniel's going to make choices. Every one of us are going to make choices at times that create distance. Right? It's inevitable. While, while God is continually um, making us more and more into the image of the Son, sometimes that process is a little challenging, and when we take a step back, we want to take a step forward. All we need to be mindful of, though, the truth that was made clear in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. When you find yourself in a place that you don't need to be, just come back home. Come back home. Because there's a Father who is waiting to receive you and bring you back to where you belong. Where you can experience the power of these truths in your life once again. You can always come back home. It's made possible because of Jesus. Jesus, no matter how far you go. So, in light of all that he has done for us, how can we respond? What can we do for him? Here's two things I want to do. First one, honor Jesus with attitudes and actions that please him. I mean, when we think about it, when we think about these truths and you know, we could have sermons on each one of the passages we looked at today. Probably could have made a series out of each of those passages we looked at today. There's so much, so much amazing truth in them. 
when we think about it now, do we need any other reason to live with an attitude of thankfulness and praise? I mean, does Jesus need to do anything more for you than he has already done for you to be grateful for the rest of your life? That is the answer. And that's the answer we forget. Because we get to these things and think, oh God, if God would just do this for me, then my life would be better and then I could be happier. And we forget how great all the things that He's already done for us. If He just saved us and let, left us here to suffer for the rest of our lives, it would be more than we could ever begin to deserve. Right? And so let us have attitudes and, and let them lead to actions that please Jesus. Let us honor Him for what He has done for us. Let's get caught up in those things instead of focusing on all the things that we think we deserve from God. Let's be thankful for all the things that we don't deserve that He's freely given to us. There's another thing too. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying. Um, I'm sure you've heard some form of it. Each day is a gift from God. Ever heard that? I once came across a kind of a, a follow-up to that. Each day is a gift from God. And what we do with that day is the gift that we get to lay back and speak each night. He gives us a gift, and we get to give it back. With what we do with the time that we use, or how we use our time. So let's have an attitude that, and an action that honor. Second thing is this. People need to know what can change because of Jesus. It's not just for us to know. I mean, we need to know. Right? We need to know now what can change because of Jesus. But other people need to know through us what can change. And really, that's the appropriate response that our passage is talking about, right? You've been reconciled to God, you become ambassadors that proclaim that reconciliation to other people. Right? You can draw near to find help, to confront God, draw near together to encourage one another to love and good works. The proper response, one of the proper responses is, is us taking the opportunity to tell somebody else, whether it's inside the church, because sometimes we forget. Let's be honest about that. We forget how they can be good because of Jesus. Lovingly and encouragingly exhort one another to remember. Hey, don't you remember? This is what's been given to you because of Jesus. You can have, your, your past doesn't define you. Stop holding on to it. There's confidence right now because of that. There's hope. We need to be reminded of it. But other people do too because they don't even know. They've never been told. They think that they're past the and that it's always going to follow them wherever they go. And it's going to keep them from being able to be, uh, keep them from being able to really experience any joy in them, any peace. It's always going to be there like some piece of luggage or something that's just attached and it just comes with a package. We need to tell them. We need to tell them what Jesus has done for them. And we need to take make this a, a priority for, for each and every one of us, to make sure that we're telling other people what, what they need to know, that, that things can change because of Jesus. Because we get caught up in ourselves. We get sidetracked. And sometimes we can get so focused on all the things that God should be doing for us. I had this thought that came across as I was preparing this message. I actually made it a point and changed it from the point. And, Luckily, didn't make Elizabeth's job any harder <laughs> to be at that point. But because of Jesus, we become funnels of grace that God's love is the flow, flow through us to other people. But some people treat their relationship with Jesus as if it's a barn of blessings, where God's love is just meant to flow to us. And we store it up and we enjoy its pleasures for our own benefit. We're not barns of blessings, we're funnels of grace. We need to tell people what can keep them in their lives. What can happen because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. So how is this going to impact um, 
your life right now, and, and, and what ends up happening as you go throughout the week? Are you going to hold on to the truth so you can have peace in the present, or peace from your past, confidence in the present, and hope for the future? And it's all because of Jesus? Are you going to hold on to that truth this morning? We position ourselves. We can receive God's love, and from that we can respond to God's love, and then we have the opportunity to remain in God's love. And then we have the joy of going and telling other people about His love. All that happens because of Jesus. I want to finish up with this story. It's one of my favorite stories, but it's one of the reasons I chose to, to do it in the setting uh, first Sunday. It was a conversation Caleb and I had um, when he was four years old. We were driving on, uh, from Coldwater to Bronson. Bronson is where we, uh, Jamie and I, she definitely grew up, I mostly grew up. And uh, we were on US 12, you know where that's at. You mostly grew up. Mostly. <laughs> I lived in other cities before that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I see what you did there. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyways. <laughs> Traveling along US 12. And uh, as we were driving, Caleb uh, just asked a question. And he said, Dad, where did the sun go? It was, it was sunset. And uh, I said, Oh, hey, buddy, it, it, isn't it cool? It went to the other side of the world. And uh, he said, Yep, yeah, it did. And then, then I was thinking, well, you know, I'm not giving him real factual information, and so I better give it, you know, tell him, well, actually, buddy, the, the earth is moving away from the sun, and so that's what's happening. And he could have really cared less about that, knowing that, and so he just sat there thinking for a minute. And then he said to me, Daddy, what's the, what happens when people touch the sun? And I was, oh, well, no, buddy, you know, uh, they, they, they can't do that. Uh, he was persistent, and he said, no, but, but what happens when they do? Well, well they, they can't, but it will, it will hurt them. And he still wasn't satisfied. But, but what happens when they do? And at this point, if you've ever had this type of conversation with a four-year-old, you just say something to try to, it's the, it's the end of the conversation, right? So I abruptly just said, well, they just burn up. He got quiet for a second. And all of a sudden, he said this. Yeah! <laughs> then they can shine, too. And then there will be a bunch of suns I just kind of, oop, draw, draw, and God spoke to my heart. He's like, isn't that kind of what it looks like? Touch my son? That, that they shine, and then there's a bunch of little suns all around, having an impact? And I just kind of sat there in the car. I said, yeah, buddy, I guess they would. Because of Jesus, we can become like Jesus. And we can help other people know that they belong in Jesus. Until the day we get to stand before Jesus together. All made possible. Every single bit of it. Yeah. Because what needs that? We're going to do something that we, it's going to become a staple um, in, in, uh, on Sundays. This was another thing that happened uh, at some point in my ministry where I felt prompted by the, the Spirit in, in, in that moment by the thought, you know, we, we hear a message, and then right from the message, we go right into a song, and then we're already thinking about what's we're going to do. Like, right now, you guys are thinking about when are you going to stop talking so we can go eat? <laughs> and our minds begin racing. And sometimes we miss the opportunity because we've been listening to the TV talk interact with God ourselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just take a little bit, three to five minutes. There's going to be some, some questions on the screen. There's opportunities to, to have someone pray for you if you want. And we're just going to spend some time in reflective prayer before the worship team comes back up. I want you to think about a couple of things. What have you learned about God or been reminded about God this morning? Let's see how many questions you this There they are. How do you need to respond to to as well in light of all of that's been said this morning. Is there something that you need that you need to talk to them about in light of this message? 
How do you need God to lead you and protect you from this point forward? Let's take some time and just reflect on those things and reflect on this sermon. God is speaking to us. He's reminding us of the things that can change because of Jesus. Don't leave this place. Don't transition to a great meal and a great fellowship. God wants to do a little bit more on your heart. Let's just take you a couple minutes to interact with him. And so the guys are going to play some instrumental music. And um, at some point, when, when uh, we're ready, the, the team's going to come back up and lead us in our final song. And let's take a moment and reflect on the word and reflect on what um, Jesus is saying to us.